Christmas. I don't know, but uh, uh, we may do. Wow. It, yeah. That'd be that'd be something that's pretty rare over there. We, yeah, we I mean, when, when I was a kid, I mean, they all the Christmases were, you know, cold and white and layers of snow. So things have really changed just in my lifetime. Really? Really? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, well, we, yeah. we, uh, we're not only looks like we're going to have a white Christmas, but um, it's going down to single digits tomorrow night. Oh, uh, which is not like single digits in the UK where you guys yeah. are. But single digits here is really cold. It's, and you probably got the, the wind chill as well? Yeah, there'll be some wind chill. There'll be some wind. Yeah. And get yeah. that, really, that really cuts through you, doesn't it? That Boy, cuts through yeah. You. yeah. Yeah, you got to be prepared. So we're we're live, and I want to uh, welcome uh, welcome the audience uh, to this uh, uh, conversation I'm going to have with Charlie. I, <laughs> I, um, I, I don't know how to introduce Charlie. I don't, I, as most of you know, I don't like kind of formal introductions, but I'm happy to, for Charlie to correct me at any point. I just want to say that Charlie's one of the, um, it, it was one of my real, uh, it, it was one of the most enjoyable new friends that I found this year. Uh, just recognizing and experiencing him now in a number of different uh, contexts over the last uh, almost 12 months now. And I mean, it, and, and, and really showing up in character, in characters that stunned me every single time. So I, I want to say that the first meeting we had was at a Golden Civilization conversation. Mm -hmm. And Charlie was dressed all in black, if I recall, <laughs> and, and was was quite a presence in this uh, in this historic uh, coffee house in uh, on the Strand uh, yeah. in the center of London, a place where William Blake had had ventured, and many of the deep thinkers of the Enlightenment in in England had had, had held debates. And we were holding a golden civilization conversation there. Charlie shows up uh, with a, uh, a, a lovely uh, friend uh, out of the blue. I don't think any, I don't know if anybody knew him, but and and he proceeded to have such amazing presence in the uh, in the meeting. He was uh, strong, articulate, challenging, creative, inspiring, um, and in, and really engaged. And one of the things that I recognized then and then through other encounters with Charlie, Charlie has recently done a TED talk, which I hope all of you will visit on, um, on uh, the health, uh, health uh, concerns for health in, in Africa. And, um, and one of the things that I recognized, have, have learned about Charlie is that um, just as most of you know, I've got a big and bold vision for civilization. Charlie shares something very similar. He is passionate about making a difference in a significant way uh, on this planet and in a very generous way. So I, I, with that, with, uh, he's a doctor. He uh, uh, has a wonderful, extraordinary, intriguing, unusual life story. I don't know where he's going to take us today, but I'm really excited to uh, introduce you all to Charlie Eastman. Correct me, Charlie. What did I do wrong? There. No, you did nothing wrong. Thank you, George. I, I really appreciate that. And uh, I'm really looking forward to having this conversation with you. Yeah, wonderful. I also want to say that I, I, another conversation I had with Charlie was so, so uh, gentle and quiet and deep. And, uh, and his knowledge is, is wide ranging um, uh, and, uh, and, and experience as well. So um, so Charlie, why why did you why why are you looking forward to this conversation? What are you? Yeah, um, well, I think George, when I met you and what you're trying to do, I was really excited because, um, like a lot of people, I feel that um, certain aspects of the world and society have lost their way, and like a lot of people, I also felt that there was a period. Um, let's say in the 60s, where you had people like Martin Luther King, you had uh, John F. Kennedy, uh, you had Robert Kennedy, you had named people who you could say were um, at least trying to do something decent with the world and in society. Okay, there may have been other more negative aspects of what they were trying to do, but at least you could name them. And what I realized in the current civilization, there's very few people who you can name who are uh, holding a flag for a better society. 
we can name all the racists, we can name all the far right people, uh, we can name all the, uh, you know, media savvy, uh, uh, let's, uh, unpleasant people, let's put it that way. Um, but I thought there was a real need for a flag bearer uh, of uh, a different idea around society. And when I uh, met you and saw you talk, I thought, wow, this is one of those guys. So I was very excited by that. Wow, well, I, I remember, I mean, I never told you my reaction afterwards, but Charlie said something in the meeting, as, as I say, the, the setting was extraordinary. And, and Charlie said something about the work that we were doing in Golden Civilization, and maybe me personally, and refer, in reference to the, uh, the Kennedys and the change that they helped bring about in the 60s. And I was just totally blown away. I, I, uh, I'm sure I didn't show it in the, in the meeting, but afterwards I was just, completely stunned and uh, uh, and wonderful to hear that from you, Charlie, and that you still hold, and, and you and I share this, hold that idealism. Yes, yeah. we, we know the weaknesses now of both Martin Luther King and, and the Kennedy brothers, and they overlap some of those weaknesses. Absolutely, yeah. But we know also their uh, tremendous strength, their uh, fire, their passion to make a difference and how much, I mean, that we're even talking about racism now, partly, mm. partly owes, goes back to that time when they stood, stood boldly up and said, no, we, we need to have a new world. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the scary things, George, if I'm really honest, is that um, a lot of those people were killed, assassinated. And that then I think led to a lack of people wanting to put their head above the parapet. And so I think we've had 30 or 40 years with a certain nervousness uh, among people who are what I call right-minded um, to even stand out because the consequences of doing so can literally be deadly. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, the, uh, those consequences feel, for, for myself, mm. feel even more scary now. Mm. Part, partly, yeah. I think, because of the, um, well, what's happening in America, just the, the rise of, absolutely, of, you know, the, uh, uh, it's really out there, it's out there in the media, it's out there yeah. dominating politics. Um, yeah. And I, and luckily, I mean, one thing at, at age 71, you come to a point where you go, well, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think the other, the other brilliant thing I think you've done here, George, is by, um, creating the cellular structure of a golden civilization. Uh, with all due to respect, it, the flag can be taken up by others and it is being taken up by others. And that's a wonderful thing because um, if you were just the representative and someone you know, uh, from some dodgy government agency decided to exit you, shall we say, um, then the story would be over. But the story's not over uh, because you've written the book you've encouraged people to have these conversations. And I gather you've had uh, many groups around the world, which I think is wonderful. And I think that can just only expand. And even conversations like this, hopefully will get more people engaging in it. And so uh, in a way, I see it almost as a form of uh, cellular resistance. <laughs> so so, so <laughs> you've got the current uh, dominate, dominant groups of, uh, uh, nationalistic, um, sometimes uh, populist uh, people who seem to be winning. But underneath that, there are still really decent people with really decent concerns about the world and about society. And OK, yes, they may not have their moment of power now, uh, but these things seed over time. Right. Yeah, that's I mean, you see that and you wonder how are how are they so powerless? Uh, I mean, every day yeah. in the in the news, you're seeing people come out and say, "I was a, you know, a, a Republican and still am." But you know, I'm totally against what's going on now in America, and yeah. this has to change. And you know that they that it's the belief in the rule of law and the building up of of social conduct and uh, um, and and truth in and science and all of yeah. those things. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm excited. I'm I'm uh, I, I've been on tour all year, and I'm going on tour for this next year. Fantastic. Uh, yep. And and uh, we've got Sweden coming up. I've never been to Sweden. Oh, um, love it. Yeah, going to do yeah. Belgium and and 
uh, and a number of places in America and come back to the UK quite a bit. I, I'm curious, I, I want to, there's a couple things I, I'd love to hear from you, Charlie. This is wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your accolades for what we're doing. And, uh, and thank you for your contributions to it. Um, we just lost the image. There it comes back. Yeah. So there's yeah. two things. One, one, I want to talk with you about your TED talk. Yeah. Because clearly that's something you're very passionate about and something that you're adding uh, mm -hmm. to, the, to the mix right now. It's, it's new and fresh and unusual uh, in a way. Um, but before I get there, I want to reference your background. And I don't mean your personal background, but I'd love to hear your, I'd love to hear that too, because that I know some of it, if you feel like sharing it, uh, yeah. it just, you know, it's really, really interesting where, where you've come from and uh, to yeah. be who you are. But I'm also looking at the physical background behind you right now, the red and the black. <laughs> And and it reminds me of the uh, uh, back in the '60s, the the fist and the and the uh, you know which was also red and black and and going on strike and all of that yes. reminds yeah. me of some images that I saw in the old days of Che Guevara, and okay. but but I don't know the person who is in the image. Oh who, right, well that, that's actually Nefertiti. So uh, this is a, a very clever piece of art where someone took the famous image of Nefertiti. Uh, Tutankhamun's wife, and he um, sort of slightly pixelated it. So uh, when you can see the image in uh, more detail, I may actually just try and move the camera so you can uh, see it. Um, you'll see uh, what he's done there. So he's he sort of pixelated the image of uh, Nefertiti. And, uh, you know, um, that is regarded, uh, obviously she's regarded as one of the most beautiful images uh, in the world. And uh, I've always liked that, and then I like art, so I collect art. And yeah. when I saw that, I just thought I have to have that wow. uh, DT uh, in my <laughs> wow. in my living space. And and actually, my carpet below me, which you can't see, is Tutankhamun. So I actually have a carpet of the gold mask of uh, Tutankhamun, which I bought in Egypt more wow. than more than thirty years ago. Wow, Charlie, how amazing. And, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll have to share our art collection sometimes. I mean, obviously eclectic and, and a lot of yeah. friends and all of that. But I have a, um, the, uh, from one of the, I think it was a Michelangelo sculptures, mm -hmm. um, the Pieta, in fact. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I have the head, a copy of the head <laughs> of the Virgin Mary for a very similar reason. She's just wonderful. So beautiful yeah and, exquisite yeah. yeah 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 and when you when you uh, there's there's something about the uh, the feminine uh, beauty that um that calls to our heart i think absolutely and, yeah absolutely you know, yeah. calls to our compassion and calls to being uh, uh, more yeah. humane so uh well wonderful and and um <laughs> and, and anything you care to share about your background and also about the ted talk yeah. What, yeah, sure. So um, background wise, um, my mum was a single mother. She brought me up on her own. And from the age of five, I decided I wanted to be a doctor. And uh, so that was a high motivation for me. And luckily enough, I was able to go to a school where I was, um, you know, got to the level that I could get into med school. But it's interesting because I never um, grew up with my father and my father was a doctor. Yeah. And it wasn't until I was in my 30s that uh, an American had written a book about uh, doctors in Africa, and the book went back to 18, eight, 1870s or so, in which I discovered I was in a line of doctors. So I'm about, I think, number seven. Wow. Um, yeah. uh, one, <laughs> yeah, one along the way was an accountant, but I teasingly say we don't talk about him. And I know you've got a background in finance, George, so I'm just teasing you there. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so, uh, and then, and then the great thing was that um, through this American academic, I found out that. Uh, I had a great great grandfather from 1870 who who qualified as a doctor in 1879 mm -hmm. in London, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so the height of the sort of Victorian era. And I've since realized that um, prior to 1900, uh, more than 100 black doctors actually qualified as doctors in England, which I just think is an incredible story. And I'm, I'm just oh. waiting for someone to do that documentary. Wow. Wow, that's incredible. Well, you know, the, I, mean, I, I don't know enough about England and, and um, 
uh, England's history with with race. I mean, you see yeah. a bit of it as you go through the um, uh, the term mulatto was used. To, yes, yeah. Uh, with, with the mixed race and and uh, and of course you had Disraeli as yeah. the prime minister early, early on. Um, uh, but uh, t tell me about this. Uh, how do you see that? That, uh, that there yeah. are hundred. Yeah, well, I think I, I see it's a very positive story because often um, black people have gotten written out of history in a positive way. And we have a lot of dramas that deal with Victorian era. And a lot of those dramas would be traditionally all white. Um, so I think the fact that there were, you know, qualified, educated doctors of uh, uh, black color and skin uh, walking about mixing in, in that era is a story that more people should uh, be aware of and certainly for the black community to be very proud of. And uh, incidentally, uh, I've also discovered that a lot of them were the prize winners because they were the brightest scholars, uh, some of them from missionary um, funding uh, sent to England to learn the art of medicine so they could go back and then contribute in their communities. So I think that's fascinating. Now, what we don't know is what uh, they faced, you know, in, in terms of day-to-day -day encounters. And undoubtedly, they probably did face some levels of um, discrimination. I think in all societies, you get that combination of uh, ignorance of racism, but you also get another group of enlightened people who are prepared to take you as you are. So um, it, it'd be hard to know what the exact balance was, but I think if I were doing a documentary or a film, I'd focus more on the positive than the negative because the negative has always been there. We know it, uh, anyone with dark skin uh, has heard all the negatives. Um, and I think it's nice to counterbalance that with more positives. It'd be, it'd be wonderful. I mean, it's a, uh, a lot of the um, work that I uh, originally did in money and a lot of the way I've thought about uh, Buddhist practice as well, to, uh, meditation practice, is as going into the darkness and emerging into the light. And the, the image for that mythologically was Joseph Campbell's popularization of the notion of a hero's journey. And mm. it would be uh, wonderful to see uh, that story, that story of these heroes uh, uh, in the black community uh, becoming, you know, great, uh, you know, great men in, in the society. And, and, and yeah, I mean, I know so much more about, you know, George Eliot not being able, or Jane Austen not being able to really publish under the female, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. name yeah. all of that. It'd be it'd be really fascinating to hear Charlie and to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And and where where has life taken you now? We know that uh, you're a doctor now. You've uh, you've come through a, a really an extraordinary uh, family. Um, and uh, uh, where are you now? What, okay. Well, I, the lucky thing, George, I have two wonderful children. So my son is 19, and he's gone into the acting profession in fact uh, uh he's on a date tonight so i'm wishing him every luck with that <laughs> hey. i've got a i've got a delightful daughter who's going to be five on the uh, 28th of december so uh, she's, she's a real character and uh, so a delight for my life and then on the personal level uh, i have a, a portfolio career so um i'm lucky that i spend some time in my own clinic two days a week then i also work for a, a hospital trust in London, uh, Barts Hospital, and I see all the NHS staff who have problems and are referred to occupational health. So that's always interesting uh, wow. and trying to help them with any issues they have, whether they be mental health issues or physical issues. Yeah. Then I also have the privilege of uh, talking in schools around the country on issues like mental health, which I'm very passionate about. And I feel that it's very important to speak to young people early and as early as we can uh, about mental health, to destigmatize it, to raise awareness of it. And uh, as I say to the young people, I say, look, you know, I'm going to teach you how to signpost, but don't expect to be a savior because um, you don't have the skills yet to be a savior, but at least you can signpost uh, for a worried friend where they should go. Um, so that's, that's a, a big uh, excitement for me. And I'm hoping to generate some more content around that and eventually get into the universities as well. Um, but the other project you mentioned was my TED talk, which I did back in uh, June in Heidelberg. Um, and uh, the subject of the day was who cares? And all the speakers had to 
come up with a theme around something they really cared about. And mine was uh, global health issues, because uh, I'm very concerned about the fact that when a crisis occurs, the global response is left to one or two major agencies who 70 years on, I think they've slightly definitely lost their way. And in terms of organizational efficiency, it isn't there. And I do believe that the public who sit on the sidelines and often think, oh, well, you know, we've devolved that responsibility to them, uh, uh, would be quite appalled when they realize how problematic that is. And so by setting up a new global health agency uh, to rival the World Health Organization in global health emergencies, uh, we'll engage a whole group of uh, gas lights, as I call them, because it's called Global Health Action Trash and Solutions, but very engaged people with very rapid uh, responses and a huge range of talent uh, and innovation, actually, to deal with some of these crises. Fantastic. Uh, uh, Charlie, you, you've covered a lot of ground there, and I've got so many questions. Let me see if I can uh, uh, narrow them down just a bit. Um, maybe the first one, just in terms of uh, a comment, and then come back to your vision of this global health uh, agency. Um, and while you're doing that, George, I'll just get my charger because I'm worried the uh, phone. Oh, okay. Might... All right. Good, good, good. You, you, I can still listen. You fire away. All right. Well, um, the uh, uh, just one thing, you know, it's so interesting. You've done so many things and it's, it's inspiring. It's always mm -hmm. inspiring talking with you. And it's inspiring hearing about your engagement with mental health, with your both having your private uh, uh, a med medical uh, business and also then working in the public uh, sphere of, of, uh, of a hospital and all. Um, but uh, I, I just wanted to share with you something you might be interested in. One of the leaders of the Golden Civilization Conversations uh, in uh, the UK in the London area has been um, uh, um, uh, learning from suicide prevention uh, group Oh, uh, right. on um, ba basically listening skills. He's yes. always a very, very fine listener. But, you know, that that capacity to listen in such a way that we really are trusted. It's something, yeah. of course, that we want all institutions to do. And I'm sure that's one of your, one of the themes of your global health agency. So I just wanted to mention that, that that's a theme. Yeah, thank you. And that you and that's I, a wonderful thing. And it links very nicely with... Uh, uh, the lady that I'm linking you with, Trudy, who um, set up the uh, group to uh, sidewalk talk to help people, uh, trains people to talk to people on sidewalks or pavements around the world. And I think she has 4,500 volunteers now, just wow. in that space. I'm so looking forward to talking with her. I think I'm talking with her later this week. Oh, um, wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. And, and, um, uh, and, and so the other thing that was really interesting in the TED talk. This is just, uh, and for everybody to be aware of, you know, hearing Charlie, you, you think, um, you know, Charlie's concerned about so many issues that are issues more on the left side of things. He's very mm -hmm. concerned about health. He's concerned about racism. He's concerned mm -hmm. about um, uh, Africa um, and uh, justice and all of these things. And what was what's wonderful about Charlie, he's always full of surprises. And one of the things <laughs> in the TED talk is that he's actually talking about an inadequacy mm. uh, in our public health mission and advocating in the, at least in this one place for a major venture that would be private. Is that is that correct? Yeah, because um, my, my take on charity is that um, charity is good in some areas, but in health, uh, I've seen some negatives around the unsustainability of certain types of charity whereas i believe that this model should be a not-for-profit business which is designed to survive and to last because uh, these vulnerable people deserve that so i wouldn't want it to be literally a flash in the pan and then because the donations had dried up because it was charity based it right. didn't uh, reiterate um, so to make it sustainable i want it to be run on business lines and to have a, a very solid uh, business foundation. Fantastic. It would be non-profit. That's right. I mean, the thing is that if you run it as a business, obviously uh, a business is designed to at least have some margin in it. 
And what I wouldn't want is uh, five years later to find that one of the uh, CEOs or the chief operating officer was boasting about his Ferrari. Uh, you know, the point <laughs> is that they, they uh, everyone involved would get properly paid. That's not a problem. I don't have any problem with that. But I think the important thing is to plow the marginal profits back into helping the vulnerable people, which we originally set out to do. Yeah, lovely, lovely. Um, it just sounds wonderful. We've uh, publicized the TED Talk on our sites. Uh, Thank you. Please, uh, everybody go look for Charlie Eastman uh, and his TED Talk. Uh, um, Charlie, I'm wondering just to go back to a kind of a large frame and you and I mm. can talk forever and, and so, on so many different topics, but the, the frame of nonprofit, government for profit I, I yeah. mean, right, right now we're um you, you know the, the, there's obviously dangers and can be yeah. dangerous with any one of them how that's do right. you, but, but you've thought a lot about this uh, that's right how, yeah. how do you okay well i, I see if we start with the for profit you've got the carnegies the Rockefellers and people like that. And uh, Carne Andrew Carnegie's great quote, you know, the man who dies wealthy dies disgraced, uh, I think is the one that's partly motivated Bill Gates to give so much of his money now uh, with Warren Buffett to great causes. And so there is a, a point that um, super wealthy individuals can themselves do amazing things, even if we question how they got to that point of being the super wealthy individual. So I think Carnegie's legacy is a fantastic uh, legacy, um, even if we deconstruct how he got there and maybe say that at times it was a, a bit unscrupulous. Um, Rockefeller, obviously, uh, there may be issues again with some aspects of uh, how he um, uh, defied antitrust laws and everything else, but to get to the point. But a lot of people don't realize that he was one of the major funders of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Wow. So he helped set that up. Wow. And one of the other interesting things about Rockefeller is that his money helped uh, the American South get rid of yellow fever and uh, hookworm um, wow. because they were endemic in those parts of the world. It's, 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 it's another reason they were poor. Um, so if you've got disease, you're going to be poor, <laughs> full stop. And uh, anything you can do money-wise that at least uh, changes that um, has a long term benefit. Yeah, fabulous, fabulous. Yeah. So, so I wonder, uh, we're, we're nearing the end of our time now, and uh, it's just been wonderful to touch base. And I wish we did have much longer to dive in deeper in a variety <laughs> of, of areas. Um, I, I, I uh, wonder if we could close on a large theme. Uh, and, and that is the um, you were passionate in the meeting where we met. You're passionate mm -hmm. about making a difference uh, in mental health in, in the UK. Um, mm -hmm. you're, you're able to take your passion into both your private business and your uh, more public one. Uh, yeah. uh, and I, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, one of the challenges that I set out in the golden civilization is, let's make this golden civilization happen in a single generation. Yeah. Well, we're, we're taking too long, making too many compromises. Let's make it happen An enough. Yeah. And, and so the question, the question coming back to you would be, what would be the, the single most, what, what would be the thing that you think would be the most powerful way that we could really make this happen in a single generation? Wow, that's a great question, George. I think, um... Right, we need uh, a group of leaders who uh, commit to the principles of the golden civilization. Um, I think we need to uh, change how we uh, elect people and take, as you rightly say, the money out of the equation. Um, I always remember this great quote from Gore Vidal, where he said that every year on the hustings, every American politician should wear a suit which represented all the people that sponsored them. And if, you know, if 90% of the, uh, their funding was from the gun lobby, that's what you'd see. So Ooh. you can at least visually uh, know that. Um, so <laughs> I, I, I thought that idea was mine. Gore uh, said that, wow, Gorbidol. totally. Yeah. Uh, but so, so I think that issue around transparency, knowing why people 
uh, are pushing certain agendas. Um, that's all the stuff that we as the public uh, need to know. And I think we as the public need to better educate ourselves as to what the hidden agendas are, as to why people are advocating X or Y or Z and who's really behind it. Yeah, fantastic. So if I hear you right, I'm just gonna mention it. Uh, um, you talk about we need, we need to have leaders, really great leaders that we know where they stand and we know we can trust them. We need yes. an election process that can deliver those leaders rather than bought purchased politicians uh, mm. through, uh, uh, through finan financial means. We need uh, transparency wherever leadership uh, arises, wherever power arises. We need a transparency Absolutely. so that we, the public, can actually make intelligent decisions. And the other piece of that, making intelligent decisions, is we need, we need a great education system mm. and, and perhaps uh, truth in media would help too, so that yeah, we know absolutely. what's true. Yeah, is that is absolutely. that? Absolutely. Yeah, and 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 that's right. And I think you know, I think everyone should read Noam Chomsky and Noam's great book on uh, manufacturing consent, which explains to you in in very clear terms how the Western media is actually controlled. You know, it's not as it's not as free a press as we would like to believe it is. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful, Charlie, and I and I'm uh, I'm. I want to leave you with a, I know you're a great reader and I want to give you a book that you may not be aware of. And, um, uh, and I'm, I'm trying, I'm blanking on the name. The, the name of the fellow is Gus Speth, S-P-E-T-H. Okay. He has, yes. when you read his name, when you look on Amazon, he's got sure. two other names. Okay. And Gus is part of one of his names, but spell right. the last name. And it, right. it's something about the American priority. Okay. And he did, to a golden civilization, he, he was in the Carter administration, the Clinton administration, major environmentalist, ran the mm. School of Forestry uh, and Environmental Studies at Yale. And mm -hmm. uh, so very intelligent fellow and is passionate about bringing all of the movements that are out there together under one Wonderful. roof, if possible. Yeah, exactly. That, that, that and, sounds good. And he has many policy elements that mm. I uh, hint at in and, and mm. speak to in Golden Civilization, but he's much more articulate and kind of professorial uh, identifying right. them. Excellent, excellent book. I think okay, you're Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll look that one up, George. Thank and, you. And inspiring. If you can't find it, uh, email me. I'm about to do a post on the opioid crisis, uh, a Facebook oh, right. post. And okay. I'm gonna have his name in that post. Thank you, George, I'll, I'll look for it. Yeah. yeah, wonderful to touch base. And you too, my friend. Uh, any really. other opportunity we have, I'd just love to, and uh, I'll certainly keep you posted on our next trip to the UK in the spring. I, I so much look forward to seeing you again, George, and thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Thank wonderful. you. Thank you so much, Charlie. Take okay. care, my friend. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.